So in this video, we're going to talk about synchronous data flow, which is a very old programming and scheduling model, which has been used in hardware and software, but uh, it's probably most known for being used to implement high performance signal processing operations. So in synchronous data flow, computer programs are represented as graphs rather than as sequences of statements. Um, and nodes are operations which fire. And when operation fires, it consumes some data and then sends that data to channels that sit between operations. Uh, and an operation fires whenever uh, the data that's uh, that it needs in order to fire is sitting on the channel. So for example, here's a simple data flow graph where we have three nodes. One is labeled U and it's an up sample. We'll explain that in a sec. One is a multiply and one is an add. And each edge in this graph is annotated with numbers which indicate how many tokens or how many pieces of data have to be sitting on that edge in order for the corresponding receiving node to fire. And then the outgoing edges are labeled, and the edges are also labeled on the outgoing uh, part with a number that indicates how much data is produced by the node that's firing. So for example, an upsample takes in one piece of data and produces two pieces of data because an upsample takes in one piece of data and then just emits it twice. An adder takes in one piece of data from each of its input edges and produces one piece of data on its output edge. And a multiplier takes in one piece of data. It, actually, a multiplier takes in two pieces of data, but just suppose this is multiplied by a constant. So it takes in one piece of data from one edge and outputs one piece of data. And then these boxes just indicate the capacities of the FIFOs sitting on the channels. So here's an example execution of a synchronous data flow graph um, with the firing schedule up sample, multiply, add, multiply, add. So we'll take in, the up sample will start by taking in a token and passing two tokens into this edge, which fills up the FIFO on that edge. Then multiply executes, which puts uh, a single value in the FIFO on its edge. Then the add is ready to execute. So it consumes one value from each of the FIFOs on its edge. Then the multiply executes again, producing a value, and the add consumes the value. And notice at the end, we've gone through, we've fired all the nodes in this graph at least one time, and there's no data left in the FIFOs. So at the start of this firing, uh, or this group of firings, there was no data in the FIFOs on each edge, and at the end, there's no data in the FIFOs on each edge. Um, and this is a really nice firing because, and a really nice schedule because of that exact property, right? So we can repeat this sequence of operations over and over and over again for infinity and never run out of memory because this sequence of operations guarantees that every single operation is gonna happen at least once. So the system's not gonna starve. There's no operation that's gonna never happen. And also the total amount of data in the system is not gonna change through this firing, which means we're never gonna overflow the buffers that have been allocated. And so we can just run this program with the sequence of operations over and over and over again. For example, uh, you know, on an embedded chip that's sitting out in the field or in a piece of hardware in a data center that's just grinding away all day doing the same thing over and over again. And we never have to worry about starvation or about buffer overflow in the execution of the program. So this kind of firing schedule in synchronous data flow um, is really powerful and really useful. It's a nice static way to schedule com programs that do things like signal processing operations with a guarantee of no starvation and with potentially small statically sized buffers. Um, but how do we find this sequence of firings? So the answer is to basically reduce the problem to a linear algebra problem. And that's pretty much always the answer in these kinds of scheduling things. The answer is, uh, you know, feed the problem to an ILP solver, but let's talk about exactly how to do that. So the first step in solving a synchronous data flow problem or in coming up with a schedule for a synchronous data flow graph is to create what's called a topology matrix. So a topology matrix is a matrix built out of the labels that we showed last time, plus some labels from uh, each node. So the topology matrix has one column for every node in the synchronous data flow graph. And it has one row for every internal edge. So an internal edge um, is an edge between two nodes. So for example, we have three external edges here, right? We have a, an edge coming from the outside world into the up sample and the outside world into the multiply. And from the edge into the outside world, those are not counted in the topology matrix. 
So we have two internal edges and we have three nodes. So the topology matrix is a three column, two row matrix. And in the topology matrix, we label each entry in the matrix by the amount of data that's produced or consumed on that edge when a node fires. So for example, in column one, row one, we put two because node one, the up sample, writes two pieces of data to edge one when it fires. And similarly, we put minus one in the row or in the column three row one entry because the adder, which we've labeled column three, or which we've labeled three, consumes one piece of data. So a negative value means consumes and zero means nothing. Of course, node two is not connected to any arc or excuse me, to the arc between the up sample and the add. So it consumes and produces zero elements on this, uh, on this arc. And likewise, if you look at row two, which describes the data production and consumption behavior on this arc of the graph, um, the multiplier, which is in column two, produces one piece of data every time it fires on this edge. And every time the adder fires, it consumes one piece of data on edge two. And notice that actually we could perform column operations like we could, the numbering is completely arbitrary. We could, uh, you know, permute these columns. We could permute the rows. The matrix is still gonna have the same properties that we need to compute the schedule. So we just need to come up with an arbitrary numbering of the edges and of the nodes and build this matrix based on the annotations of edges, which describe the production and consumption of data. So the next concept, which we're gonna go over more, in more detail in the next video is a firing vector. So this matrix seems pretty weird, right? What's the point of constructing this topology matrix? And the point of it is that this matrix allows us to represent the effect on buffer size of activating a node as matrix algebra. So if we take the topology matrix and we do a matrix vector multiply by a matrix, and we think of the rows of this matrix as representing whether one of the node, the ith node in the system fired, then the resulting vector is the effect of that node's firing on the total amount of data in the system. So for example, in this case, the firing vector 0, 1, 0 denotes number, node number two, which is our multiplier firing. And when we do this matrix multiplication problem, what we're going to see when the multiplier fires is well, two times zero is zero, plus one times zero, which is zero, plus minus one times zero, which adds up to zero. And then we also get zero times zero, plus one times one, plus minus one times zero, which is just one. So we get the output vector zero, one, which denotes that the multiplier, again, rows here denote edges, when the multiplier fires, it adds one piece of data to arc two and none to arc zero. So this might seem like a very weird formalism, but creating this data structure, which allows us to represent the firings of nodes and their effect on buffer sizes as a linear algebra problem, actually gives us a really powerful and general hardware scheduling procedure, which is the grandfather of many, many other modern techniques for scheduling high performance hardware designs. And it's something that I'll talk to you more about in the next video.